Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome and thank you to all our viewers from all across the world for joining us on our ninth episode of 10 limited series of Let's Talk Live with Sandy. I'm sorry that I was not here last week. Um, I had bronchitis and I had lost my voice and I'm still not 100%, but it's coming back and, and I can speak this week. So here we go. Um, so let's talk live with Sandy, it's where we bring awareness and give a voice to survivors of domestic violence, as well as men and women who are looking for ways of being empowered in their lives. And my name is Sandy Mech, and I am a certified life and health coach. And in my coaching practice, I coach clients on becoming empowered after abuse, trauma, illness, health, or any kind of life setbacks. I also coach clients on living a healthy lifestyle after being diagnosed with diabetes, celiac, or hypothyroidism, which is what I have. And having hypothyroidism and celiac is not fun. <laughs> so if you have any of those things and you would like to know a little bit more about it, please check out my website at sandymech.com. And if you're interested in being coached in any of these areas, I am available. Please check me out. I'm also the author of The Unwanted Wife, a number one bestseller on Amazon. And just a reminder, The Ungracious Daughter, which is a prequel of The, Ungracious, the Unwanted Wife, is set to be released in November um, um, or, or early December. Um, so be assured it will not disappoint. So today on our ninth episode of Let's Talk Live with Sandy, I'm excited to introduce my guest today on Let's Talk Live, Dr. Gloria Lee. I call her Gloria, who I met um, when I was writing my first book. We were writing our first books together through our publisher, The Ultimate 48 Hour Publisher. So Dr. Lee is a psychologist. I will welcome Gloria and let me do the official introduction before we go into things. Okay. Dr. Gloria Lee is a psychologist, clinical director of Brentwood Counseling Center in Vancouver in Canada. Amazon best-selling and award-winning author, professor in counseling, psychology, a clinical supervisor, and trainer for therapists and graduate students. She's a sought-after speaker, consultant, and advocate for social justice and mental health. For almost 25 years, Dr. Lee has been an authority on relationships and personal development. She also worked with thousands of individuals couples and families and organizations improving their relationship and mental health. Dr. Lee is, a passion, is passionate about all things relationship and believes that healthy relationship contributes to healthy people in mind, body, and spirit, and healthy societies. Check her out at drlee.com, on Facebook at Dr. Lee, and Instagram at uh, Dr. Gloria Lee. So, Thank you for being here with us, Gloria. I'm so, like, I'm just honored to have you here. And thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Anything thank you for you, having else me. you would like to add? No, no, that was lovely. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's so lovely to see you again. I know, right? Definitely. We haven't seen each other in a while. I was just complimenting that your hair had grown so, so long <laughs> after we hadn't seen each other for months. Oh, right, right. I think I haven't cut it since the last time I saw you. So, <laughs> well, you look great as always. Thank you. Uh, you too. So, would you like me to get into the questions? Sure, that would be great. Well, one of the first things that uh, a lot of people ask um, in regards to um, to counseling, and I actually wanted to talk about your book a little bit because I love the title of the book. It's <laughs> called um, "The Kick Ass Couple." You know, the kick ask couple secret to greater closeness and connection. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, seven ways to transform your relationship. Yes. Amazing. I love the, I love the word kick ass. I just it just gets your attention right away. Um, oh, thank you. So tell me, what are the biggest mistakes that couples make when trying to resolve conflicts? Yeah, there's many, but let me sum up the main ones. And uh, for the listeners today, I really want you to think about yourself as I'm saying these and think about which ones apply to you. Okay, so I'll go through each one and then we could go more in detail of why these things are mistakes. 
So the first one is focusing on the content of your argument. So focusing on whatever you're arguing about instead of why you're arguing. That's the, the first thing. The second thing is focusing on who's right or who's wrong. Because when we do that, it implies that there's a winner and a loser. And so that's never the right thing to focus on if you want to work together as a team. Uh, the third thing is focusing on your partner's bad behavior. And when we do that, we're, we're, we don't give our partner a chance to be, be good or <laughs> because we just keep focusing on the bad. Um, and so that's another one. And the next one is focusing on trying to change your partner's bad behavior instead of kind of looking at our own stuff. Uh, and again, similar to that is we try to fix the problem. The number one thing when I see clients, they come in and they always tell me, fix our problem. So that's another mistake. And the last one I can really think of is when couples think that their past history has nothing to do with the present situation. So past history, including our childhood upbringing, um, maybe some past relationships that we may have had, that we discount the influence that may have in our present situation of why we argue. So those are some of the biggest mistakes. Uh, definitely, I can see I can see a lot of people trying to fix the problem. I mean, like yeah. fix the partner. Um, I mean, in in the past, I tried to do that too. Um, it's I'm sure we all have. So I'm sure we all have. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I could go into yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I, I was just thinking that if you want me to expand a little bit on why these things that people focus on make um, conflicts a little worse. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, you're probably just about to ask me the same thing too, so sorry about that. It's okay. Um, okay. Um, so for the first one, I said that when you focus on the content, what that does is it only helps you to focus on the current situation at hand and not the underlying issues that is driving the fight. So every time we fight, it's probably, you know, this time is about the garbage, next time is about the dishes, the next time is about the kids. So you're just fighting about one thing after the other, but we don't pause to really think about why don't we keep fighting about these petty little things? Like what's driving this? And so when we're able to slow down and think about these underlying issues, it makes things a lot better. However, most couples go so fast when they fight that all they think about is that issue at hand. So that's why that's a big mistake. Uh, the second mistake that makes things worse is by focusing on who's right or who wrong, who's wrong. And as I said earlier, that implies that there's a good guy and a bad guy or someone who's going to win or lose. And in a partnership, you're on the same team. There's supposed to be unity. And so it's sort of like scoring on your own goalkeeper. It just doesn't make sense. So if you're focusing on who's right or wrong, you'll always get it wrong, both of you, and you'll both lose. And the next one, focusing on your partner's bad behavior, all this does is makes your partner feel more defensive because you're just picking on them, telling them what they did wrong. And by human nature, like all of us feel that way, that when someone you know just targets what we've done wrong, we naturally get defensive. We tune the other person out or we just start you know, telling them, well, you're like this too, or look at what you've done in the past. So it becomes this very much um, tip for tap thing. Um, and not only that, but when you only focus on your partner's bad behavior of why they made you mad, it makes you look like the victim, which means I didn't do anything wrong. And it's just you that did something bad. And so that is a very unfair um, evaluation of the situation as well, because as we all know, it takes two to tangle and our behavior, oftentimes it drives our partner's behavior as well. And when we're not uh, self-aware, then it'll always look like that they're bad and we're right, or we're, we're not, uh, or we're, yeah, we're right and they're wrong. It also encourages a negative mindset about your partner. So 
you know, if we're always looking for the bad, we can find it. Mm -hmm. Even even if, you know, your partner's like 90% good, but if you just hyper-focus on, oh, I, I bet you he's going to do this again, or she's always like this, then you're looking for that. Yeah, and, and then you, you get for, that mindset, yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. And then you'll, you'll find it, right? And so that's the part about, the, the, the dangerous part about always looking for your partner's bad behavior. Um, and, and then again, the next one is focusing on the problem. Why that doesn't help is it never helps you to understand what's driving your fights or why you're always fighting in circles. Why are you always fighting about the dishes? Because trust me, it's never really about the dishes in and of itself. Most of the time it's about something a little deeper. Um, and I could get more into that later. Uh, but again, so when you fix the surface issue, you'll never get to understand the deeper root problems. And so the last one yeah. that makes things worse, right? Pardon me? These are the mistakes that makes things worse. If yeah, we're, just focusing, are... we're focusing on um, the, the situation itself, like what, what made us fight in the first place, focusing on um, the, the bad behaviors. <laughs> the bad behaviors, who's right and wrong, um, who on the content itself and try to fix the problem like oh next time I'll just do the dishes then or something like that just a quick fix yeah. but the most important mistake that I think couples make which most people don't think about is how your past influences your present situation most people that I've worked with they'll tell me that you know that was the past and this is the present and it has nothing to do with it yeah. and when we don't understand, you know, we get triggered when we're, we argue. This is why we argue in the first place. And when we get triggered, triggers are basically unresolved childhood wounds and baggage that comes into a present situation that we're not aware of. Because what may trigger you, it might not trigger me and vice versa. And so it's really important for us to understand why am I triggered by, I don't know, dirty dishes, whereas my partner doesn't care about that. Yeah. What does it mean? And what kind of feelings does it actually trigger in me? And therefore, how does it make me want to react to the situation when there's dirty dishes? So that, that actually drives all the arguments, I believe. So what are solutions to like, not focus on those things? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say the most important thing, I mean, in a nutshell, focus on the opposite. Okay, so what I mean by this is instead of focusing on your partner, what they've done wrong, how they could do better, how they could fix the situation to make you happier, focus on yourself in the situation. Notice that when we argue, we go really, really fast. Like we can be having a nice conversation and then all of a sudden, you know, it escalates really quickly and then we're mad. And we think to ourselves, like, okay, within 30 seconds, we're mad at each other. What happened here? And what happens is that we get triggered, we feel angry, and then we react right away. And that's how uh, uh, arguments escalate really, really quickly. But what we can do instead is when there's a trigger, it's still the same trigger, we need to pause, go inward first before we go outward, and to ask yourself, What's going on for me? Why am I so angry all of a sudden? We're just having a nice conversation and now I'm really, really upset. And figure it out that, okay, oh, it's because my partner did this again after I told him or her five times that I don't like this. And really, it, it makes me feel unheard, un, unlistened to and, and uh, misunderstood or not validated. Mm -hmm. And those are typically the main things that I see. So when we're able to kind of slow down the process and tune in to what's going on for us first, and then we could go outward towards our partner afterwards and let them know that, hey, you know, it kind of it feels a little hurtful that I've told you this five times before and you just did it again. It just feels like, you know, feels like you don't care when I say these things. You see, when I say that, it comes across a lot softer than you always do this and you never listen to me. Yeah. And, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's very different, right? So you can hear the difference between a reaction and a response to the same trigger to the same situation, but you would elicit a very different response because you're not reacting out of the situation out of anger, but you're probably still 
responding, but responding beneath the anger to really tell yourself or tell your partner what's going on. Like maybe it's about the hurt, about fear, sadness, feeling alone. The more vulnerable emotions that we typically don't want to talk about. And that's why the anger is sort of like a bodyguard. It shows up to protect us so mm-hmm. that, you know, we won't get hurt again. Um, and But if both people are doing that, well, guess what happens? Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. It's like our, our two younger <laughs> selves having this sparring match because they're both angry, trying to protect ourselves instead of really slowing down and knowing that, hey, wait, we're partners here. We love each other. We yeah. live with each other. We want yeah. the best for each other. This is not how we want to behave. And oftentimes couples would tell me that, how come I act this way with my partner and nobody else but my partner? Like, you know, they bring out the worst of me, right? And it, it's true. Why? It's because we feel the safest with them. So we could be our real selves with them, for better or worse, right? And, yeah. and so... I- I, mm-hmm. I agree with that. For me, I think that what you have to be aware of is be respectful. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, most people know it in theory, but in the heat of the moment, all rational goes out the door. Why is because the thinking part of our brain goes offline when we're angry and our emotional part of our brain takes over, it hijacks us. And so by pausing first and then going inward, as I said, and to evaluate mm-hmm. what's going on for me and then go outward and respond to your partner, you, you're creating this buffer for yourself so that you're not just reacting in the heat of the moment and typically with anger, and, but you're able to keep it a conversation instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have a friend who um, it's, it's, it's about the dishes. And she'll come home and and the dishes will be in the sink. And this is not only her her spouse, but her kids as well. And she would always be fighting about the, the dishes in the sink or you know, if the kitchen not cleaned up afterwards. And and then one day she said to herself, Why am I fighting with them? Maybe you don't care if the dishes are in the sink. Maybe it's just me that care about the dishes. So yeah. I'm just going to do the dis- dishes and shut up and it's going to cause a lot less issues. And she's been focusing on that and she's fine. Yeah. And, Hard you know, I think you bring up a, you bring up a really good example and not many people come to that conclusion of, oh, I'll just do it myself. Or they do it in a very passive aggressive way where yeah. it's like, fine, I don't need you. And, you know, yeah. screw you type of thing. Right. Yeah. But I think it's it's again it's not about the dishes it's mostly about and it could be any chores but the thing that couples fight the most about are the daily mundane routine things right and so it's never about that it's typically about care do you really care for me am i important enough to you that you when i tell you that i want you to do the dishes that you will do it not because of the dishes it's not about the content remember but it's really that you're looking out for me. You know this is what I need or what makes me feel good and that makes me feel loved and safe with you. But when you continually leave the dishes in the sink for me, it implies the opposite that you really don't care and I'm all alone in this. And so I got to take care of myself and that's where passive aggressiveness comes in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so get, you, you know, finding solutions to the, the situation is probably easier as well, right? Yes, for sure. And so I I often tell couples, don't jump to solutions right away that, okay, it's about the dishes. Then, you know, you do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'll do it Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and we'll eat it on Sunday. Yes, sure. That's a, a quick fix. Okay. That, that for that particular situation, mm-hmm. but I bet you next week, you're going to fight about the laundry <laughs> and then the groceries and then cleaning the toilet and so on and so forth. Why? It's not about that thing in and of itself but it's really about what I said going beneath and understanding I mean it might seem like a very silly thing when we talk about dishes but when I when we go deeper and it's about learning to love me and showing care that when I ask you to do this you're looking out for me that means I'm important to you and how that has so much to do with our past 
for most couples I work with, they'll talk about how growing up, they never felt like their parents really took care of them. They were on their own. And, you know, when they ask for their needs, their parents will say, you know, grow up or, you know, um, I don't know, suck it up or listen to your parents and respect me. And so they feel so um, invalidated and misunderstood or not listened to, not seen, not heard. And so it comes out again as a trigger now. And that's why when you don't do the dishes, I'm going to have this big reaction. And the partner is usually like, what the hell? Like, why <laughs> are you having, right? Like, it's just the bloody dishes. Who cares? <laughs> but really, it's not about the dishes at all. It's about you're, you're doing to me exactly what my parents did, which is to neglect my needs. And, and, but we don't, we don't ever say that, first of all. And we don't even mm -hmm. understand it at, to that level. But as I mentioned, every single trigger that we have is an indication of unresolved childhood wounds showing up in your present Absolutely. marriage right Absolutely. okay and those who are I, yeah <laughs> I, I mean you, you i know i know that coming from uh you know like coming from a parents who were, parents who were very strict who were yeah. you know focusing on yes um how we should do things instead of focusing on you know who we are yes right yes absolutely it, it's, a, it's a tradition thing and and absolutely you're absolutely right and we in the coaching in coaching uh, we call it the why we need the why yeah so yeah absolutely why we need, yeah you're you're absolutely right and you know just taking the same example again if if let's say i'm that partner that says you know that means you don't love me or you don't care about me because i have to tell you five times to do the dishes and you know, then I, the only time you listen to me is if I yell it to you, right? And the other partner, typically, it brings out their own triggers as well, that um, usually they feel like they're not good enough, that whatever I do, you still find fault somehow and criticize me. And if it's not about the dishes, then it's about the laundry or about the kids or something like that. And so it goes back to their own childhood wounds where they might have had a very critical parent that always said, hey, you know, look at, your report card here, you got all A's, but one B, what's up with the B? And the hyper focus on the negative. And so we become ultra sensitive to the negative as well, that that becomes our trigger. And yes. so, you know, for a, a, a typical person, it might be not a big deal. It's like, you're asking me to do the dishes, not a big deal. Or you told me five times and now you're upset. Okay, I take that and I own it and I'm sorry. And, you know, I won't do this again. But for someone who has that kind of history, which is a lot of us, by the way, like 75% of the population have this kind of history. So that applies to most of us. And if you think you don't have that kind of history, you're most likely married to someone who does. Who does, okay? yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you think about like our, our arguments are usually, what they're about is our triggers coming out from our childhood stuff. And we're just kind of firing away at each other, projecting it onto each other and hoping for the other person to love us the way that we really need to be loved, that we weren't loved growing up. So yeah. really that's the deeper issue that I really want people to think about. What's the parallel between how we argue now and what uh, I was missing in my childhood so that there's no, you know, because when we can do that, then we can ask for what we need that, you know, this really hurts a lot. I know it's just about the dishes and it feels really silly, but, I was never listened to growing up. And I feel like you're doing the same thing now when I asked you five times to do the dishes, right? That will come across a lot more because your partner loves you and they would feel compassion when you say to them that, hey, there's this parallel and I don't want you to hurt me the same way I've been hurt. That comes across so much softer than, you know, you never do the dishes and yeah. I have to, you know, the only time you listen to me is if I yell at you. That I mean, who wants to do it then, right? Okay. Exactly. And this is how we create the same circular loop. I know. I mean, I mean, I mean like I took, it took me several failed relationships to realize that I, I don't need to yell. I don't need yeah. to yell or to get angry to get my point across. And it's not only through um, relationships that I've learned not because I see my parent, my, my, my dad would yell for us to do things. Or, yes, or yeah. he, he would even yell at my mom. And yeah. so that was how I grew up. Um, always right, having right. Me to, to like, that's how we grew up thinking that we need to raise our voices so that we can have that authority. 
Right. And so I, I think you bring up, it, it, that is such a good point that you brought up. Um, because we typically replicate what was done to us, modeled to us, or taught to us, mm -hmm. because that's our template. We don't know any other way. Right. And it was kind of the acceptable way of doing it in our family of doing communication and arguments or because we're so repulsed by how we felt growing up that we vow to ourselves. I'm never going to be like that. And so we swing the opposite extreme. Opposite. It's still a reaction, but we swing the opposite way thinking, you know, I'm never going to yell. So what happens? We become super passive aggressive instead that we never say to the partner. <laughs> You know what we want right but it's like we hint that oh i hope you could do this and you know I, i'm so tired i'm so busy or something and they don't get the hint then you feel upset and then you give them the silent treatment instead <laughs> that's no better right? and that's not good either right no it's not it's not it's still a reaction right so this is why we need to understand what's driving our reaction our behaviors and when, once we figure that out, and it's always about self-reflection, it's never about, well, it's because my partner did this or didn't do that. Yes, but that's just the trigger, the symptom of what's already going on inside for you. So mm -hmm. that, it's such a powerful thing. And I often say to my clients um, doing counseling or couples counseling that I'm doing individual counseling with two people in the room that, sitting together that yeah. happens to be married. And that's it. Yeah. I know. And, and for me, I, I've learned, uh, like I said, uh, over the years that I can't be passive here because that didn't get me anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I communicate a lot. I, I do a lot of communication with my husband. And, yeah. you know, if I have anything on, that I need to speak about and, and even not only with my husband, people know me for, for, the, for the same fact that if I have something that I need to talk yeah. about, I got to talk about it. So I find the time to communicate about it. Yeah, and, and I'm that's not perfect, like in any way, but I try not to get into like, you know, raising my voice or arguing. Um, I, yeah. I've, I've learned a lot, <laughs> believe me. So oh, tell absolutely. me, what should couples be focusing on instead? Yeah, what they should be focusing on, as I said, is themselves, right? To focus on what are some of my leftover stuff from childhood that i'm still working through and you might not know but you will know because those are things that uh, triggers you in your partnership okay a hundred percent and if that doesn't trigger you in partnership it'll trigger you in all other relationships as well like maybe with your kids with your friends with your colleagues with your boss but it will show up these same triggers over and over again so think about your triggers okay and it, once you think about your triggers, it's really hard to change because now you know about it, but what do you do about it? And like how you said, um, it's really about healing yourself and being, being kind and compassionate to yourself that I used to be either aggressive or passive and that didn't do me any good. But now I have to learn to be brave. And part of being brave is self-healing, saying I have a right to speak my truth, to tell my partner what I need and what I want. And to trust, to really trust that my partner has my best interests at heart. They're not out to get me. And so this is really the self-growth. And I believe that no pain is ever wasted. And if you're able to take our pain and to transform it into courage by asking for what we need in the current moment, you can really, really undo a lot of the harm that was done to you. Absolutely. And, and and like going back to, you know, like our childhood, um, like our inner child, I would say, and then mm -hmm. focusing on, on being greater, you know, like greater than our inner child was like fix, go back and uh, reinvent that wheel kind of thing so that we don't, we don't lead by example kind of thing. So that like, like for me, I always, like I said, my, my dad had that authority figure where he would always raise his voice. And that was my inner child thinking that I needed to raise my voice to get my point across to my kids or to get my point across mm. to, to my spouse. And, and that, that's not, you know, that doesn't work. I remember one time um, I was yelling at my son because we had made a deal that he, he, he's not able to DJ unless he has like straight A's in in class and he's like right on the on the honor roll and all that and on his first um year of grade nine his grades had dropped 
Mm -hmm. and and I started yelling at him when I saw his report card and mm. I, and I remember exactly where I was I was at the bottom of the stairs mm. and he's on top of the stairs and I'm yelling at the bottom looking up at him and he looks down at me he goes why are you yelling mm. I know I messed up I know mm. I have to fix it mm. but if you mm -hmm. yell it doesn't make a difference I know if you can no, talk about it you don't have to yell no, it doesn't make a difference. And in fact, it makes the situation worse. And I often say, think about how you felt growing up when you were yelled at. And this is yeah. exactly how your child feels now uh, or your partner, right? And so that's why it's so important for us to slow down and just think, like, what's going on here? Why am I yelling in the first place? And where did I get that from? And why do I feel the need to yell? Most yellers, by the way, yell because they were yelled at. And yes. this is not only what they learned, but when you're yelled at, remember, you're the recipient of it. And that means you never feel understood or heard, right? So you learn to yell again to feel like someone can hear you. And we perpetuate the same thing. So, you know, our children then become either yellers or withdrawers because mm -hmm. they are either scared or they'll learn to do the same thing again. So yeah. it doesn't do anything helpful. Yeah. And at that point, I realized, what the heck am I doing? I'm doing the same thing yeah. that my dad did to me yeah or, or yeah. to us and right you know like if right so i pull back right away and i and i and i looked at him and go oh my god i just learned something today i didn't yeah. need to yell at you <laughs> no no and that and i think that's um really self-awareness right there because you took that moment to take a step back and say why was i doing that i don't need to do it that way there's yeah. a better way yeah. right and yeah. and i think that there's also there's compassion for your son that you see the effects on him but you also see the effects on yourself that you're like i don't that's not the kind of mom i want to be exactly. right? Or, or, right it doesn't make me feel good that my my children hate me because i yell at them all the time right mm -hmm. so exactly yeah. and so i mean i mean i took a step back and realized that that's not the way sh things should be and yeah. i actually focus on that going forward not only with my kids but in my relationship as well that yeah. that that i you know i wanted to make myself a better person absolutely and i think you know again you were able to slow down and have that commitment to yourself that i want to do better for myself and for my kids now mm -hmm. most people when they're reactive they react out of shame that you know, my kid's mad at me because I just yelled. Then instead of focusing on my shame mm -hmm. that, um, you know, my son just told me that I don't like it or they're yeah. crying or something like that, or they yell back, I will just react and put them in their place and say something like, you know, you listen to me because I'm your mother or, you know, that's disrespectful or whatever it might be. That's actually our pain and our shame speaking for us, the mm -hmm. reaction, instead of saying, wait a minute, you're absolutely right. I felt the same way when I was yelled at as a kid. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to learn uh, about being a kick-ass couple, obviously. And um, and one of the things that I have learned is, you know, do not shame anyone, do not make anybody feel guilty, do not make anybody feel um, obligated, you know. So those are the things that, for me, I, I mean, this is my third marriage, so I've learned a lot <laughs> in the, yeah in the past. So right. Like I said, no pain is ever wasted, right? And so it's, yes. it's, we learn the most in the hardest moments of our life. And so if we listen to our lives, it will always give us wisdom and something to hold on to for next time to become better and not bitter, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what you, you just so said. Thank you so much, Gloria, for being here. Oh. Any last words before we close off for tonight? I would say, um, well, thank you, first of all, for, for this opportunity. I love talking to you and I could I probably gab for another half hour. I, um, I also want to say, even though we're focusing so much on our relationship with our partner or with our family members, it really begins with our relationship with ourselves. So even as you said, Sandy, that, you know, um, to respect the other person and not react out of shame or guilt or obligation, it's really for ourselves as well to not shame ourselves, not guilt ourselves, not do things out of obligation, but really be our authentic self and be the best version of ourselves so that when we take care of ourselves in that way, then we are better for everyone around us. So yeah, so thank you for that. That's, yeah. that's so great. So for this week, I would say to the viewers, focus on yourself, 
focus on self-care. And thank you for, you know, being with us here tonight. We will be back. We will go back to, through the Facebook uh, com comments and answer anything. Um, would you like to maybe uh, share where people can reach to you and, you know, talk about your book a little bit so that they can, you know, get a copy of your book as well? Sure. Yes. Um, so you can get my book on Amazon. At, um, it's called The Kick-Ass Couple, uh, Seven uh, Secrets to Transforming Your Relationship. My website is drgloriali.com. All that information is on there, uh, as well as um, my Facebook and Instagram handles. I also want to offer all of our listeners today um, a free gift. I have, um, it's called the Kick-Ass Couple Secret to Greater uh, Closeness and Connection in 10 Minutes. And if you go onto my website, uh, you can sign up for it and it'll be sent to your mailbox right away. So that's also, it. So, uh, so yeah. can I put the link at the bottom? I, you had sent me a link, right? Can I put that yeah. link at the bottom of the, the comments so that people can get a copy of? That's great, Gloria. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Well, have a great week ahead and i will call you back so that we can talk about some other things have okay. a great weekend a great week ahead and thank you so much for joining us everyone